Hey everyone, this is Rohan Shaw with BestEconTutor.com and in this video we'll be talking about measuring income, measuring inequality, and tax systems. So, measuring income. There's basically two ways you can measure a country's income. One thing you can do is average, or the mean, of every person in that country. So let's say we have five people in our sample. We have a country, we took five people, and we want to know what their average income is, the mean. Well, we could just add up the five numbers and divide it by five. It's what you're probably used to for the average. So here, these were the five numbers. We just add them up on our calculator, we'd get 250 divided by 5 is 50, so the mean income, if this is, for example, in thousands, this would mean that, you know, the average person, uh, we'd say, makes $50,000 a year. Now, a median is a slightly different way to do it. That's just uh, put the numbers in ascending order, smallest to biggest, and just pick the middle number. So in this case, again, if we wanted to know the average income of everyone in a particular place, we could take a sample, we take a sample of five people, put them in smallest to biggest, the middle number here is 40. So the median would simply be 40. So again, if these were in thousands, we'd say the median income is approximately, you know, 40,000 and the mean income is, is 50,000. Now, why might you want to use one over the other? They have pros and cons. You know, the mean's easier to find as far as, you know, programming it into a computer or something, but the median is uh, not influenced by outliers. Here's what that means. Let's say we happen to get Bill Gates in our sample. So let's say this highest income was not 100, but like, you know, some really big number. Now the mean, when you add all those up and divide it by five, is gonna be huge. That's still gonna be like in the thousand something, when clearly that's not what's going on with most of the people in our sample, right? So still the mean can kind of be influenced by that outlier. So here the mean would go up some crazy big number, but the median would stay at 40 because the middle number is still 40. So that's why one way, one common way we actually measure income is the median. So that way, you know, if we have a lot of outliers, it's really not affected by them. So that's one way to measure the income. Now the government has these programs called means tested programs. Uh, what those are is that if your income falls in a certain range when we measure it, then if, you, if it's low enough or something, you can get qualified for these benefits. For example, Medicaid or welfare. That's basically the government's way of helping out people whose incomes are low. Now, another form of this is kind of uh, social security, where if you're not familiar with that, it's basically a system where you pay into the social security system when you're working, you know, until you're 65 or something. And once you retire, you can actually then get some money back as income. So even though you've retired, it seems like you should have no income, but you still have income in the form of social security payments. And same with Medicare, that's health insurance that you get, again, for free when you're uh, past retirement. So those are the benefits you can get. And you can kind of think of that as being added to your income when you get it when you retire. Now let's talk about how to measure inequality. Now, the main way we're going to measure inequality is this thing called the Gini coefficient, G-I-N-I, -I, and it's always between zero and one where one means it's totally unequal of a society, and zero actually means perfect equality. Everyone has the exact same amount of money. Your Gini coefficient is zero. And so the higher the Gini coefficient, the more unequal the society is. Now, before that, we have to talk about what's called the Lorenz curve. And so using the Lorenz curve, we'll be able to calculate the Gini coefficient pretty easily. So the Lorenz curve, here's what it's looking at. On the one axis, it's saying what percentage of the population, and on the other axis, it's saying what percentage of wealth, of the whole country's wealth, does that population have? So, simple example, what if all of the wealth in the whole country was with just one person, right? Well, in that case, even the bottom 99% of the population have no wealth, so as we'll see, we're gonna, in that case, get 100% Gini coefficient, but we'll get there, actually. Let's look at an example first, a more normal example. So, let's say we have this, uh, this breakdown into quartiles, is what it's called. This just means that the bottom 25% of people 
have 5% of the wealth. So in that case, this red line over here is called the line of, uh, you know, uh, the 45 degree line or the line of perfect equality. So what that means is if this is 25 on the line, this will also be 25%. But in our example here, the bottom 25% own only, five, only have 5% of the income. So on our Lorentz curve, when x is 25%, our y is only going to be 5%. Now, if we're looking at the bottom 50% of the population, that's this group and this group. So that's going to be 5 plus this, this next group of 25% have 10% of the wealth. So that's going to add up to 15%. So the bottom 50% of people, both of these guys, you know, have 15% of the wealth. So notice that's still way below what the line of perfect equality would have been. But yeah, that's 15%. So, so far, we have this point, this point, and then the bottom 75%, that's these three, this, these 25%, these 25%, these and these 25%. So these bottom 75% of people have 5 plus 10 plus 35, that's 50% of the wealth. So they have, you know, 50% of the wealth. Notice again, still less than what the line of perfect equality would have been because, hey, if everyone was equal, the bottom 75% of people would have 75% of the wealth. So again, that's what the red line is telling us. But again, that's not the case in this society. The bottom 75% have 50% of the wealth. And then finally, when we get to the full one, meaning 100% of people, that's adding this other 50%, that's 100% of the wealth. So 100% of the people always have to have 100% of the wealth. So when you're making your Lorenz curve, 0% of people always have 0% of wealth, and 100% of people always have 100% of wealth. So it's always going to share these two endpoints in common with the line of perfect equality. But as we saw, we have these points. So our graph ended up looking like this. So this is our Lorenz curve, is this line. Now we can kind of break this up, this triangle, we can kind of break it up into area A, that's everything over here. And then this, the re remaining part, this is area B. So, notice here's the thing, if everyone was truly equal, the Lorentz curve would be the line of perfect equality. Because, hey, if we lived in a society where all these were 25%, then we would have gotten exactly these values on the line, right? Then the black line and the red line would be the same, and this area A would be zero. There would be really no area over there. So, in that case, here's how you measure the Gini coefficient now. Now that we have the Lorentz curve, we broke it down into this area A and area B, the Gini coefficient is simply area A divided by what, by what A and B add up to. So A out of A and B. So it's kind of like a percentage, this much portion out of this much, A plus B. Now here's the thing. If, if you count, you know, the percentages as like, you know, 100% is 1, well then this whole box is like 1 by 1, right? So the area is 1. So this triangle, A plus B, is really always just 0.5. It's really just 1 half base times height, so 1 half 1 times 1. So it's really A over A plus B really turns into A over, and then A plus B is 0.5 which dividing by 0.5 is the same thing as multiplying by 2. So you could also just use 2a. Once you find the area a, you know, as some number between 0 and 0.5, obviously, then it's going to be twice that is the Gini coefficient. It's really just that out of the total. Either way is fine. You'll get the same thing. Now here's the thing. If we were to look at some of the extreme examples, like I talked about, uh, if you do have a society where everyone has the same amount of money, then your Gini coefficient is zero. So zero uh, means perfect equality because in that case, the black and red lines are the same one and so area A is zero. So zero out of 0.5 is still zero. So that's why there's you know, no inequality. Now, basically, long story short, the more your line goes closer to the edges, the more unequal your society is. The most extreme example is, let's say, the bottom 99.999% of people have zero dollars. So they clearly, everybody has 0% of the wealth, and just that last one guy has everything. So when you do 100% of the population, you still have 100% of the wealth. Your Lorenz curve in that case is basically almost this, this, this shape, this triangle almost, right, without this line. So really just this part. So really area A is, is the whole A plus B. So really A out of A plus B is 100%. It's just one, and that's perfect inequality because basically all the wealth is just with one person and everybody else has zero. 
So that would be the other extreme. So in general, just remember that, you know, the more closer to that extreme point, the more unequal you are, the closer to the line of perfect equality, the more equal you are, the less your Gini coefficient. And in general, one thing to keep in mind, is this really doesn't tell you uh, the wealth level, meaning how many, how much money you actually have. It doesn't tell you whether you have millions or billions or so if you have two different countries, you can't really compare how much money is in one versus the other if all you know is the Gini coefficient. That's just saying within that country, how much wealth is concentrated with just the top. That's what Gini is measuring. Now, finally, let's look at some tax systems. Now, in the United States, we kind of have a bracketing system. That kind of means if you want to look at your marginal tax rate, you kind of have to see which bracket your income falls into. Now, notice I said marginal tax rate, meaning that's the tax rate you pay on your the very last dollar that you earned. So here's a really common misconception that let's go over right now, by the way. Let's say this is what the bracket system is, where if you fall anywhere in this range, this is your marginal tax rate, anywhere here, it's this, anywhere here, it's this. So let's say somebody makes $30,000 a year, and they're complaining, and this is a genuine complaint that a lot of people have, that, hey, if I make 30000 a year, and if I, you know, work a little bit harder and make 31000 I'm actually kind of going to be screwed over because now I fall into a higher bracket and then I'm going to actually come home with less money. Here's the reasoning. They say, all right, if I'm making 30 k I'm paying 20% in taxes, right? Which means I keep 80%. So 80% of that 30000 means I come home with $24,000. All right, 24000 not bad if I'm making thirty. Well, let's say I worked a little bit harder and now... I made 31000 so keep in mind, if you're here, you've worked harder because you have to earn that extra $1,000. But now, if you have to pay 30% taxes, you only get to keep 70% of your money, right? But it's of a bigger amount, 31 instead of 30, but still, so you only keep, you're only keeping 71, 70% uh, of it, so you only get 21700 instead of 24000 So notice, you know, if you had to pay 30% taxes instead of 20, then even though you earn more, you're actually bringing home less. So that's a genuine complaint that a lot of people have. That's why they'll like try to fudge their income to kind of stay in a lower bracket so that way they, you know, pay a lower tax rate. But that's actually not how it works. That would actually be very unfair, but that's not how it is. If you make 31,000 instead of 30, you will bring home more money. So here's how it actually works. If you make 31,000, you will pay the same amount in taxes as somebody who makes 30,000 for the first 30,000 that you earned. So really, only for that extra 1,000 of your income. So if you made 31, you know, only 1,000 of your income fell into this uh, bracket. And so what that means is the 30% you're paying is on just on the $1,000. So you're actually bringing home more money. Again, out of that extra 1,000 that you earned, you're basically paying 30%, meaning $300 in taxes. So basically, whatever you made at 30, if you now make 31,000, you're gonna come home with 700 more dollars. So it's not quite as unfair as people think because if you, even if you fall into a different bracket, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. You're actually still gonna bring home more money. It doesn't penalize you for making more in that sense. You know, you, there is a lower incentive to make more. So here's where a tax system can either be what's called progressive, flat, or regressive. Progressive is where the more money you make, the higher your overall average tax rate is. Now, flat is when it's the same percentage of your income, regardless of how much you make. And a regressive system is actually, you know, that if you make a higher income, that you're actually gonna pay a lower percentage in taxes. That's back in the day with kings and queens, you know, they made the most money, but they didn't really pay taxes. So that's a, that's a regressive tax system. So progressive is what we have in the US today because if you make more money, you're gonna pay a lower tax rate on average. Now that's, this is again, the marginal tax rate. So if you wanna find the average tax rate, you just have to look at if you made $31,000, you'd say, all right, for the first $10,000, you made, uh, you paid 10%. And then for this next 20,000, you pay 20%. And for that last 1,000, you paid 30%. So you'd do the weighted average of those. Most econ classes won't really have you calculated it. Uh, but that's how you do it. it would, it's going to be somewhere in between there. But that's the average. But what you're given in the brackets is usually just the marginal. Now let's look at a couple questions from students. What exactly is the difference between Medicaid and Medicare? Good question. One easy way to remember it is, Medicaid, aid, and Medicare is care. One is for, you know, people with low income, one is for older people. So 
for people with low income, we usually give them aid, and for older people, we usually give them, you know, care. So, you know, Medicare is for retired older people. They collect that with Social Security. And Medicaid is a means-tested thing. If you fall in a certain income range, then you'll get Medicaid. Either way, they're both the type of health insurance that you get, again, Medicare for older people and Medicaid for poor people. And our final question. If the median is so much better than the mean, why do we even use the mean? Good question. Now, we looked at an example of why the median was better because, you know, if you have an outlier, then the mean's going to be kind of, you know, really influenced by it and it might not represent the average number and the median would do a good job in that case. But there are other cases where the mean's actually kind of a better representative of the average. Uh, for example, let's say the data set was 0, 0, 0, 10, 10, something like that. Now, if you were to look at the mean, just you want to kind of find the average, you'd add these five numbers up and divide it by five, so you'd get 20 uh, divided by five, which is four, so the mean is four. But if you were to look at the median in this case, that's just, they're already in ascending order, so the middle number is zero. So here, if you were to tell somebody that, yeah, the, the average is zero, versus the average is four, you know, if, if we're using either of them for average, usually mean means average, but either way, if we're using either one for the measure of sort of the center of the data set, here in this case the median probably doesn't do a good job because, you know, it makes you kind of think that everybody's at zero. If you were to say, yeah, the average is zero. But here, if you were to say the average is four, that's kind of a little bit more representative that there's some people above, some people below. So really, it kind of depends on the situation whether the mean's better or the median. Well, I hope you now understand economics better, and if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning, customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you, 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.